Rave to the Grave. Welcome to Rave to the Grave. My guest on this show is O.J. San Felipe, who isn't a traditional raver in the EDM sense, but certainly is by the 1950s definition. The one popularized by Buddy Holly's Rave On and the Yardbirds having a rave up. OJ is one of Brooklyn's most recognizable characters, and he's synonymous with New York City's garage rock scene. He's played at literally thousands of DIY venues in bands like X-Ray Eyeballs, Golden Triangle, and Chorizo, and taken the stage alongside Black Lips, Cat Power, and the OCs, sometimes covered in blood, fake and real. He also DJs hip-hop, electronic, and 80s stuff at bars and clubs around town, and makes weird dark wave in groups like Sad White Guys and Acetone 4. But OJ wasn't raised in rock and roll. He grew up in San Francisco in the Filipino backyard party scene, which birthed scratch DJ heroes like Qbert and Mixmaster Mike. Later on, he went to goth clubs and giant raves in Oakland and all around the Bay Area. He also has some crazy stories, as you might imagine, so I thought we should hear some of them. OJ, welcome to Rave to the Grave. Hello. It's good to see you outside the context of being my roommate, and you have a million stories that I never even got to hear. So Yeah, that's so weird. Thankfully, what? you're on this podcast, and uh, we can hear them now. Yes. So, I mean, I think a lot of people associate you pretty deeply with the sort of garage rock, DIY, underground rock scene here in New York. But I kind of wanted to find out what you were doing leading up to that point and then like how you how you got here in the first place well i grew up in the mission and uh, this is the mission district of the mission san francisco district. yeah and um i grew up in a mexican neighborhood and all my friends were little cholo kids so so i was basically a cholo kid <laughs> and and uh the store where uh, everyone's families got their clothes was this was this place called La Pating's. Actually, that was a Filipino-owned place, and everyone got their kids clothes there, and it was all like Dickies and Ben Davis, bandanas, and just all the stuff little cholo kids were. And my friends would be like, you should wear a hairnet. And so then I'd start wearing a hairnet like them, too, and do those cellophane calls. Like, ch -ch -ch -ch. What's that? I don't know if it's like a gang thing, but you use a piece of cellophane, and it's like chirping. You chirp at each other. You're like, beep, 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 beep. So we'd have like little lowrider bikes. And, and it, it was funny. My cousins in the suburb, we'd visit them or they'd visit us. And they're like, why are you such a little cholo? But it's just how I was, where I lived. I didn't even know any other way really to look like. But yeah, grew up in the mission. There's a comic book store there that we would go to and get comics. And that's where, that's where I got actually learned a little bit about music because they sold zines and T-shirts, which I w we would get just because they look cool, but we didn't never even heard of those bands, you know. I remember I had a GBH shirt. I didn't know what it was. I had the, the Misfits skull. I think I had a Mentor shirt, and I, I, I wasn't even really into music, really. When you first kind of fell in love with music or you had some music that you called your own, like, what was that? Well, I think it was Chipmunk Punk. I got a chipmunk punk record for a gift, I think. Uh, my uncle gave me the monkeys, and I thought that was really cool. I was really into the monkeys. And I wanted, and I, re I was really into like the Grease soundtrack and Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> this actually all makes perfect sense because <laughs> you're, I think, you're somebody that has like a really strong aesthetic. And every time you start a band or you're in a band, it always has like a look and a theme and like a very specific thing that you're doing. So you like the monkeys and stuff, but when you actually started going out to any kind of like shows or parties, like going out without your parents, where, <laughs> what oh, was the, that? The first things were, were probably um, the, the DJ parties. Well, back then the, um, people would form little DJ crews, 
like mobile DJ units and um, mostly Filipino in the Bay Area and and just uh, DJ at, at like rec halls and garages and garages with like and bring everything, turntables, like truss bars, hook up lights on there, have like giant earthquake speakers for the bass, like bring every, it's almost like a mobile club. And um, it's funny because every city had their crews and every city broken down, like was broken down, like every school had their D, 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 D. it was so many. It was almost like little gangs. And it was kind of like little gangs because there'd be brawls and stuff and you just play like someone else's party in another city and those crews would want to fight you because you roll in and you just come in there and take their girls and stuff and you know you're just more desirable because you're an out of town dj i don't know what <laughs> but what so what cities are we talking about here just like all the like san francisco daily city like san jose Pino, vallejo Fremont, like Union City, everyone had their own crews. And it, it was like, even even like uh, Qbert, Qbert had uh, his crew in Balboa High School. They would have a party called the Octagon that I would go to. I'm like, oh, this, this is so sick. You know, it's just like, because no one's old enough to go to any clubs yet. So it's like our clubs, you know. What would you have been wearing and what, what would you have been listening to when you went to the Octagon? It would be like a lot of hip hop. And electro, like b-boy, electro music, some soul, just like freestyle and hip hop. It's funny because um, I grew up like dressing like cholo style or or whatever. But I admired the Filipino people that came from the Philippines that weren't born here. Had like a totally different style from us. They wore like chucks and like tight jeans and leather jackets and had like rat tails. So that time there was like like bogarts were a style you know about bogarts no. they're like really baggy like pleated baggy pants like it was like a gang almost like gang fashion i don't know i just started wanting to dress like the filipino gangs kind of but it was weird because american born and filipino born was kind of like there was like friction it's really weird like you would think we'd be i'll be united because we're all filipino but and they didn't, they didn't like us. It was weird. Like, I, I don't know. I had nothing against them, but it's like the first time I saw guns and stuff and switchblades because we'd go to the arcade or something and they'd like show us their gats and stuff. And like, oh, cause there's a lot of fights in those. It was weird. It was crazy. <laughs> Tell me about some fights. <laughs> Almost every DJ gig, there was a fight. We would play a gig in Union City or some, somewhere in Fremont and South Bay or something. And then things would be going cool. Then all of a sudden, like, there'd be a fight on the dance floor or something. Like, fuck, let's get our shit and go. And we're just unplugging every all the cords, carrying all the speakers really fast. And there's, like, little fights breaking out, and ev- like, everywhere. And then, like, we're hopping into our cars. And, and usually, after we escape a city, like, we'd hang out at the bowling alley because it was, it was tw- like, op- stayed open late. And after DJ gigs, we always go to the bowling alley, get French fries, go bowling. But one time, I, I think we were coming from the South Bay. We got followed all the way, like a 35-minute drive all the way to a, our bowling alley. Like we didn't even, we got there and they all pulled up right behind us. And it was like a big brawl in the parking lot. It was really crazy. Usually, like, uh, we have, like, a couple of guys that come with us that, that's, like, the muscle, you know? Like, they bring their muscle, too. So there's, like, two big, like, S- Samoan guys fighting each other. And we're just like, what? It was crazy. <laughs> this isn't music-related, but you were telling me about a fight that you got in at a McDonald's. Oh, that was a karate school. <laughs> it was, um, the, we had a, a tournament in Reno, and before the tournament, there was, um, it, we all went to McDonald's and the rival school was there. And there was, uh, people started like chattering with each other and we're like, oh shit, is this gonna, someone gonna stop this? And, and then our sensei was arguing with their sensei and we're like, oh shit, they're, they're arguing. And then they, they started like getting in fighting pose and we're like, oh, that, that kind of gave the green light for everyone to fight. So we're just pretty, pretty soon I got hit by a McDonald's tray and I always wanted to smash like a strawberry shake in someone's face. So I, I did that. And I'm, 
I know it was, it was kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> That is like, uh, it sounds like a scene from The Karate Kid. <laughs> like, it sounds like a pure 80s movie. Yeah, it's, yeah, it was fun. I don't know, it's fun. It's fun having brawls, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, I think it has to be mentioned for people who didn't really grow up in California or the Bay Area that in the 80s and 90s, the Bay Area was like one of the hotbeds, if not the hotbed of the whole turntablist and scratch DJ scene. Like the two major crews in the beginning of like turntablism were from New York. Why am I blanking on their name with Rock Rada and Mr. No, the Sinister, executioners. the executioners. And then the Invisible Scratch Pickles who are from the Bay and like yeah. still doing their thing to this day. Qbert, um, Shortcut. It's Apollo, Mixmaster Mike. Yeah, so if you would like be in the Bay Area in the 90s, like you could just go to a scratch battle like almost every weekend. Yes. yes. And this whole thing started in these backyard parties and these yeah. school parties that you're talking about, like in the 80s. That's kind of where they began their craft and then they just took it to like a complete technical, crazy yeah, it was, Yoda like it was level. Crazy. It was, yeah. Well, when the DJ crew started holding these showcases, like there were showcases and uh, there was like one called Imagine. There was another showcase called Just for Fun. There'd be like categories, like f quick mixes. And people would have like three turntables and like stacks of records right right next to um, each turn. And just like, choo, 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 choo. like, I don't know how many hundreds of records, like in like half an hour. There'd be... Um, presentation battles like who had the best setup the the loudest bass <laughs> like it was crazy and then everyone had their own dance crews too at, like matching da dance crews like everyone did everything like everyone also tagged so whenever you dj'd somewhere like you leave your throw-ups everywhere and like everyone had business cards like mobile DJ, you know, there's like dynamic sound, mind motion, and ultimate creation. Like my friend's cousin was mixed master Mike. And I remember we went to a party and he was like scratching. And I was like, well, what, what are you doing, man? He was figuring out how to scratch, you know, before anyone did crab or any, like did anything fancy, you know? And then I remember Qbert, everyone knows about this story where... He got into a car accident and um, he was in the hospital. So he just like taught himself how to scratch for months, just sitting in his bed. Anyway, pretty soon, you know, Mix Master Mike and Cure became like the masters of scratching. <laughs> Where did it go from there? So you're, you're kind of in high school and you're going to all these, you know, backyard parties, mobile DJ functions, rec halls. Oh, oh, oh. What do you do after? Well, well then eventually there's like, um, we would go to, like goth clubs. There's a club called Drug Six. There's a club called, I think it was called Twilight Zone. Like the first time I heard like Depeche Mode and like Front 242 and, and like Nights Are Ebb. And I was like, this is fucking sick. So I started wearing like 20 eyelet docks and like coloring my hair green and like leather jacket. Like people really thought they were vampires. It was fun. It was kind of funny. I mean, it was funny to me and my friends, but we're just like, oh, this is kind of silly, but I really love it. You know, <laughs> like guys would like come up to us and like, shh, like hiss at us with like their yellow contacts and like fangs and stuff. And I was like, this is cool. This is fun. I, I, I can do it. You know, it was funny because like we would roll around in this mini truck, like blasting like hip hop. But then we'd be like, come out and we'd, we'd have like painted white face with like 20 eyelid docks and like, like grills and stuff. And and then we would go to the Filipino showcases and like be gothed out. The first records I bought, like when I first bought my turn, it wasn't even techniques I learned how to mix on. It, the belt was so weak, but I got so good at mixing that it, like, if you learn how to mix like on shitty turntables, you just become good. You know? <laughs> but I, 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 I prim primarily bought like hip hop, like booty bass, like freestyle. And then like after I started going to like these goth clubs, I started getting um, Depeche Mode, like OMD. I really like Book of Love. Like, Secession was like a goth staple. It was like the same speeds as like freestyle and like electro. So it naturally like incorporated into my sets. And that's kind of like how I like to DJ now. You know, I just like, I like to mix goth with like freestyle and 
it made makes a lot of sense to me. I don't know. Yeah, I think it. I think it does make a lot of sense, especially because they're using the same equipment to make a lot of the that you know, like because it's kind of from the same time period, like middle eighties to yeah. early to mid nineties. It's like the synths are the same and the drum machines mm -hmm. are the same. So when you take away like some of the vocal elements, you like the Depeche Mode song is like very similar to a freestyle exactly song. Yeah. I know that's how I started getting into more like techno y kind of. I got into drum and bass. I went to your club, eclectic, started going to that. <laughs> and um, there's also, yeah, I remember when like Britpop, remember when Britpop started? I, I remember like all the punks and like goths like started to dress like really nice. And I thought, oh, this is, look, everyone looks cute in this club. I liked hanging out in all the, all the little musical scenes. Yeah, San Francisco actually was a very big stronghold of like the whole Britpop thing. Yeah. There's this club uh, called Pop Scene yes. at yes. 330 Rich that doesn't run anymore, but I feel like it ran for 15 or 20 years at least um, in, in almost the same location playing Britpop. And at one point in San Francisco, there were all of these mods. And this was in the 90s. I don't, I'm not talking about the 60s, but there were all of these kids that dress like mods and like had Vespa scooters with a million mirrors on them and literally look like they came out of yeah. like the movie with the who. I lived on Clyde street right behind three thirty Ridge. So we would just walk over there and just hang out like almost, almost every other week. And, and, and that was a block away from 77 Townsend where all like the crazy underground parties where all, a lot of battles happened. So I, I was like right in the, like right in the thick of it. It was fun. So did you actually start DJing before you ever picked up a guitar and started playing rock music? Yeah. The first instrument I got was a bass. I DJed countless parties before that. Yeah. And it, it was funny too, because like my friends that were in bands would ask me to join their band, but they wanted me to like be on turntables. So I did that a couple of, those were like my first kind of band related things and I like kind of didn't like it because I was just like I don't want to be like the the Asian guy on the turntables in a band like Linkin Park you know <laughs> yeah that was a wise decision I didn't play guitar in a band until I moved to New York so before we move on to the New York chapter of OJ's life what are some of your craziest or best memories of San Francisco in the 90s my crazier stories happened after I moved here, but one of my like one of my favorite memories is like the the battle of the, the scratch pickles and executioners at Townsend was pretty cool. I mean, the rave stuff was kind of crazy because a lot of drugs involved. <laughs> Where did you go to raves at? I remember going to like. Uh, do you remember the gathering? There's this thing called the get, and then there's like the full moon parties were kind of tight because like the, it kind of moved around. And you had to find out like almost like a few minutes before to find out the location. And it'll be like, oh, we got to drive out to Half Moon Bay. Yeah, yeah, yeah we got you would drive like fucking 30 minutes to just go to. But then it was fun, you know, I, I would go to like uh, like the end up on Sunday mornings. <laughs> yeah, the remember... end up was was very legendary. So that was like. Unusual to San Francisco, there was a club that was basically open for the entire weekend, Friday, Saturday, and yeah. Sunday, and it never closed. So um, come Sunday morning, that's where all the people would be partying that had been out all weekend. And it was definitely a really crazy scene. Yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy. I mean, the thing I remember when I think about living in San Francisco in the 90s, is a lot of things were outdoors. Like there'd be like, yeah. I remember going to a scratch um, battle that was in the Golden Gate Park band shell. Yes. And there'd always be like outdoor raves or like free parties or somebody would just set up a sound system in Golden Gate Park or you'd end up going to something at the Berkeley Marina that was outdoors. There was like, like I've, I have these really nice, you know, memories that I almost can't even remember wh who was playing or what we were doing, but there were always like a party outdoors, full moon gathering at Half yeah. Moon Bay. And, um, 
yeah, like this, the weather is so nice that you can just, um, and there, and there were a lot of spaces where the promoters had figured out that they could just do a party there and the cops kind of would not, would just give them a slap on the wrist and then go away. Yeah, it was insane. There was the parties and remember the Sunday parties in Berkeley, Marina were kind of sick. It was it was amazing some of the places they had the part. I remember there's like huge raves in the like a like in the drive-in in Oakland, and you're just like, what? All of us dropped some acid, and then it got broken up. And I remember I drove everybody, so I had to drive back to San Francisco, and then the bridge was like, Woo, like a ribbon, and then the, the bridge toll person became a dragon, and I was like, this is fucked. I remember there was even raves like in Scandia. Remember Scandia? No. Scandia was is just like a mini golf place with like race cars and stuff. And people would be high as fuck driving the little cars around the racetrack. <laughs> do they still do that? I don't even know. I guess people just know more about what's happening now. Oh. But it's hard to think because sometimes I'm like, well raves were in the news already back then so i don't know how the um people who own like the mini golf place or the rock climbing wall or where wherever you were going or the drive-in drive or the drive-in like i feel like they must have known but now everything is just very strictly like yeah. permitted and it's hard to get like anywhere cool like that it seemed very lawless back then i know it was free to party anywhere it was kind of crazy and it brought everyone together i remember like it brought everyone together like Everyone into hip hop, goth, like they're all in one place. Like this, it was, it was fun. It was really fun. Like no one was excluded really. It was just like, it's like partying for everybody. Did you ever go to Home Base? That was somewhere I played a lot, which was like a Home Depot oh, yeah, in yeah. Oakland. <laughs> yes. That was like an abandoned Home Depot, but it was yeah. giant. Yeah, I remember Home Base. <laughs> and pretty soon the raves started having like, little branches in them like the hip-hop room and then the like different rooms and i guess that's where all the like hip-hop djs would start to dj and stuff yeah i once dj'd after um cubert at home base mm. when i was really young like 18 and he gave me really good advice which was that you always have to bring your own needles your own slip mats your own headphones and like everything with you because you can't rely the promoters will have yeah. any of that stuff and you have to, I mean I already knew how to hook everything up but I think I had gotten there and something was missing and I was freaking out and he was like no you have to bring everything you gotta bring all the RCA you just cords. gotta act like <laughs> you're bringing everything from your house yeah. and I was like true and then I did after that so thanks Qbert for helping me yeah. in my DJ career you pretty much Learn how to become an audio sound engineer just by DJing. Because <laughs> you, 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 you encounter every single problem every single time. It's, I don't know. Yeah, you have to fix everything yourself, mm -hmm. which is good training. Yeah, yeah. Actually great training for you being in bands. So, okay, how did you, what led you to coming to New York and when did you move here? I just got, I got bored over there. I just literally just decided I'm just going to move to New York. And I had never even been here Be because everything cool comes from New York. When we were like, when we were in San Francisco, like I remember we would, um, I remember like our dance crew, like we just wear like thrift store clothes and like kind of look almost kind of slobby. And then like whenever like the dance Crew, DJ crews from New York would come. Like, they all, like, looked really cool. Like, really fitted clothes and, like, sick shoes. And they were just like, man, New York is... Like, everything cool came from there. Except for... Actually, I expected more. I thought the executioners... I was like, we didn't know what to expect. But, damn, are they going to kick Scratch Pickles' asses? And then Scratch Pickles just destroyed everybody. So what was the first apartment that you had in New York? You, you moved here in 2000? When? 2001. In Greenpoint. <laughs> I'm laughing because I moved to Greenpoint. I had no idea 
where I was. Like I was just like, oh, I mean, I'm just in New York, you know? And I had no, like, I didn't know, I was right next to Williamsburg and it was kind of starting to be popping, you know? It was still kind of dangerous, but more, more than now, but I had no idea it, be it became like this hip spot, you know? And then in, in just by, by being close, right next to it, Greenpoint it became kind of cool, I guess. What did you start going out to when you got here? The first bar I went to was like Union Pool and then art parties where I met a lot, I met a lot of people from. Irene's Capri Social Club. I used to go to like the little Polish discotheques right in Greenpoint. It, it just felt like I was on vacation somewhere because everyone was po spoke Polish, you know, and I'm like in this weird techno club. And there's one that was right next to McDonald's. What were the music were they playing in the Polish disco? Like, like really <laughs> hardcore techno. Like, <laughs> like crazy. Oh, I would go to Lit a lot. Lit was probably the first really scandalous party I went to in New York. Like, whoa, New York is crazy. Like literally you walk in, you know, those little cubby holes down there. I don't know. I've walked into those little cubby holes countless times back then where people were just straight up having sex in those rooms. And like in the middle of a crowded club, I was like, what is this crazy? Just openly doing drugs everywhere. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's there's no more lit, right? No, um, they, they put all they put the cock in lit. That's right. I don't, so, I don't know. Like, I I remember like, remember the hole. The hole was really. I remember like when I first moved here. It, it felt like famous people were more likely to mingle at these shitty little parties back then. I remember I, I would randomly see, I don't know, like Lindsay Lohan or someone or... Do you remember back then? It was just like... Yeah, very... well, the whole for me was right before I moved here. That was one of the best clubs I think I've ever been to in my life. The whole was a club that was on... Um, second, second, second Ave. Ave. And it was kind of just like a black box. And I remember the bathrooms being so horrible because <laughs> there were <laughs> saloon doors and there were like four bathrooms. But... The saloon doors were torn off of three of the bathrooms. And then there, were, there was just all kinds of like, uh -oh. yes, like you said, like people having sex out in the open and getting blowjobs and doing drugs. And it felt like I've never been in a place like that before where like people were dancing on the table. Somebody was rolling on the floor. And then I think it might have been Holotronics that was playing because the music oh, yes. was just this mix of like you know, crunk, like Lil John and stuff, and then Baltimore Club and like all just, you could just go in there and you would be having the wildest adventure and meeting the wildest people. And I guess that felt to me like maybe this is what New York felt like in the 80s. That's what I was feeling too. I remember I was sitting there one time and John Waters was next to me. I didn't know. He was like sitting over here. And then on my, on my right, I think it was Edge. From you too? Yeah, because yeah, I recognize the glasses. I'm like, I don't know. And it was like that almost every week. There's also like a crazy... Do you remember the Bulgarian bar? Oh, yeah, the Bulgarian bar. That they, place is crazy. They, they used to have crazy parties. That's another place where it was like celebrities just kind of blended in with with a mixture of tourists and then just like, like hipsters. And it was, we, it was kind of crazy there. I remember... I, I, I remember I saw um, Elijah Wood there. And then I, I was like, well, Frodo Baggins. You said that to Elijah yes. Wood. And he, and he dumped his wine on me. And then I dumped my beer on him. And then we just started laughing and started dancing. I guess they were all, all the bars that you're mentioning too were in the same area on the Lower East Side. Because you could just run around to all of them in the same night. So Happy Endings, which used to be a massage parlor. Yeah. And still had the shower rooms in the yeah. basement where you were partying was very close to lit and the hole and Bulgarian bar and Rothko, wherever you would have been going. So it was more easy to go to six places in one night. Yeah, yeah.
So how did you end up playing in bands? Well, my friend, two of my friends from San Francisco moved here and they wanted to form a band. And I was like, yeah, sure. I'll play guitar. I've never played guitar in a band. And we played a show at um, Right Bank Cafe. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's demolished now. It was on Broadway and Kent Avenue. And it was, it was a Todd P party. And that's how I met Todd P. But it was like, um, it was a haunted cafe that sold burgers during the day. My friend worked there and he would hear the ghost of a little kid in there. Like he'd stay there all night long sometimes. And he would hear little feet running around upstairs when he was like in the kitchen and there'd be no one in the whole building. Or and he'd hear a little voice of a little kid in there and... And it was kind of like Market Hotel where you could see in the windows, like the, the Williamsburg Bridge and it, it, like the skyline. It was really pretty when like there were shows there. But it was our first show ever was, that's what my first show, you know, my first band in New York was. And it was this band called Mob Stereo. And we played with X Models and The Seconds. And The Seconds is Brian from the Yeah, Yeah, Yeah's band before Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. So... So they were like, Karen O and Nick were there, but I, I, I didn't know them yet. I don't think there was even yeah, yeah, yeahs yet. Maybe they just started or something. And they're like, I, I remember like TV on the radio were there, but they weren't TV on the radio yet, you know. But it was just like, every, every, all the bands were very supportive of each other back then. Um, then pretty soon I joined this other band called Roxy Payne. I met... K Rock and Wolfie, and I worked at their screen print shop for many years, which which was a cool place to work because they were a lot of the people that worked there were musicians and artists too, so they were very flexible. If we had to go on tour or something, then I played in a band with them called Roxy Payne. That was a fun band. Someone said we sounded like Hawkwind meets John Carpenter, which that's pretty cool. I'm not mad at that. But yeah, I don't know, and I just kept playing. In everyone's band. band. <laughs> in everyone's <laughs> band. How many bands do you, would you estimate that you've been in? Oh, no. I don't know. 50? 50, maybe. I don't know. 50. Well, only like four or five actually re- released anything, but I've played in a bunch of bands. How did you teach yourself how to play guitar? I, start, I just started playing tablatures. I remember I got a tablature of Metallica, Fade to Black, Burning the Midnight Lamp, Jimi Hendrix, I learned. That's pretty much how I exercise my hands, you know? And I realized that I, I, when you start making your own songs, you really learn better. It's true. If you play with people, then you just get better automatically just by playing with people. And then you have to learn how to co-mingle. And, um, and play with different people. You know? I get different ideas from different people. Do you think that you have a style or can you explain what your style is? I just, I like to make a lot of noise. I don't, I don't, I don't like playing for regular chord progression stuff, really. I, I just like, I, I like the people that make just weird noises with it. So, I don't know, maybe that's my style. <laughs> That's weird that you say that because I feel like you're really good at writing pop songs. Like you could sit down and just be like, write something that's like quite simple. Almost like when you think about the Ramones or something, but you can like, yes. you're very good at like writing something that's like simple and hooky. I'm very obsessed with, with catchy good songs and I will just dissect why, why they're they're catchy and I don't know I figured out some kind of a little formula I think I read some I think it was T-Rex I read somewhere that um he just crams a bunch of hooks everywhere so that's why I want that's what I do because some people just have it in the chorus you know you gotta wait for the chorus and here it comes but but if you have if you have like a if you put a hook like some kind of a hook in the verse 
in the intro and the put some every part every part of the song in the vocals in the guitar like make every it's like, it's like throw spaghetti on the wall like one of these is going to get in people's heads you know sometimes don't you wake up and you have like a hook in your head and you just you have to record it you know so that made me start to think I might have read this somewhere too, but I also start to think it maybe independently that like every every melody, every little thing is already existing. This is like getting metaphysical. <laughs> and you just got to have access and you just grab it. And that's how you write the songs, you know? You just like grab these little melodies that exist somewhere already and just put them together into songs. I don't know. Also like in more... <laughs> more uh what another rule i do is like to me like one the most memorable kind of songs is like lullabies so i try to make my rule my secret rule which i'm gonna tell everybody i make every song sound like a lullaby because see who doesn't forget like it's a bit spider so sometimes i'll just build it around make a song around like some little Thing I these words I say like in a sing song way, and then I'll make the synths and guitar around it or something, and 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 then and then I just add layers of like abrasive noise because I just like things noisy, and there you go, a noisy l- lullaby. <laughs> That's actually a perfect descriptor of what your music sounds like, one hundred percent. So, what was the first band that you were in that like really took off? I think Golden Triangle was one that almost immediately, universally, a lot of people liked. It's one, it's, it's one of those kind of bands where like, I just like hit one note and then, and then like everyone starts crowd surfing. I don't know why. Like, I've never been in a band like that. Maybe it was sexy music or something. People were always making out, trying to make out with us, having blowjobs on the couch while we were playing. It was like, it was really crazy. <laughs> who, who was in Golden Triangle with you? Um, Nicholas was the drummer. Vashti was uh, one of the singers. Carly's one of the singers. Vashti's also in a band now called Warm Drag and really, really good. Cameron, who's also in Sextile, played guitar. Alex Brown was on bass. And uh, yeah. Because you had all the sexy people in your band. That's why it was so sexy. <laughs> Maybe. I remember there was a show we, we played with uh, the OCs in a bar. It was like in a bar in Bedside called Tip Top Inn. And um, the theme, it was like really hot, like a hot summer muggy day. And the theme was like the beach. So everyone came in their bathing suits. Everyone was pretty much naked in the show. And we were playing, and there's Christmas lights in the ceiling. And um, I remember I was I was playing guitar, and I was like crowd surfing, playing guitar, and I got tangled up in the cr- lights above, and I felt electricity shoot. I like, got electrocuted, and the people holding me all got electrocuted too. So they dropped me, and I was just like, they said I was like on the ground convulsing, like ah. Because the ground was all completely wet with beer and water, and, and it was like conducting the, I know, it's conducting the electricity. I blacked out for a while, and I got up, and then started playing the song we were playing again. And I don't know, I've never been electrocuted before, but it was it, they play, it was like in the village voice, guitarist gets electrocuted. It was like a picture of me. <laughs> what a claim to fame! That was that was kind of a crazy show. I've seen so many pictures of you, great pictures from shows, and you're usually on someone's back, rolling on the floor, crowd surfing. Your performance style is like to really get involved and <laughs> just like be as like physically present as possible. Um, were you always like that? Um, or did you have to evolve into that person? I just mainly, I do it to entertain myself. Because I'm so nervous because before every show, it don't matter if there's 10 people or 200 people, like I'm so, I want to vomit before every show. 
but then like once it starts, I black out and then it's done and I'm it's like a big relief. I like going through that. <laughs> the, I like going through the torment of nervousness and then and then it's just gets purged. I don't know, maybe that's the thing I'm addicted to, maybe. So what are some of the biggest shows that you've played? I mean, I don't know if it was with Golden Triangle or X-Ray Eyeballs, but I know you were on tour with Cat Power at one point. Well, that was X-Ray Eyeballs. I can't believe the places I played with on that tour. I remember the first day we like rolled up in our 15 passenger van, you know, and we have like this shitty little fog machine and like some Christmas lights and, and like a strobe light or something, which works fine in a basement, you know, like makes it very festive. But then like the places we were playing were like 1,800, 2,000 capacity. So we rolled up and we see like three tour buses and like a semi truck. We're like, what the, like, what the fuck? And we go and then there's a crew like pulling out like all the stage stuff. They're like, you guys need a hand? Like they wanted to unload our stuff too. And they're like, yeah, there's our special effects. And then it was just like this little fog machine and some Christmas lights. Like, oh. <laughs> smoke machine puttering little puffs of smoke, like barely affecting the 20,000 square feet. It's like, I was like, oh, I, I can dig this. It's cool. <laughs> How did people react to that in the audience? They're supportive. I don't know. That's the kind of thing I like. If I go to a big show to see someone and I see the opening band and they just have like their little gear in the corner and don't give a shit. Like, I don't know. I like that attitude. Punk rock. Yeah, it's, it's cool. I don't know. I like it. I, I like chaotic things. I mean, how many times do you go to a show and it's like four guys playing a perfect set. Like, yeah, I've seen that countless times and it's not memorable, you know? It's more memorable if it's like some chaos or like... I think that chaotic factor and that surprise factor is what made a lot of those shows that you played and that, um, you know, taught people like Todd P, who is a promoter from here in New York City that did a lot of garage rock and kind of underground punk and indie shows those shows that you were playing between maybe like 2004 and the mid 2010s 2014 or something like were very special in that you kind of never knew what was going to happen there were a lot of diy venues in new york the obvious ones being 285 kent oh, silent oh, yes. barn secret project robot yes. glasslands a million other ones too that came and went like sometimes indie and even garage rock can be super manicured and like put together and it's never as fun that way. Maybe Alberto from Wowsville, that record store, remember, called me. It could have been him and, and was like, I have this band coming from Atlanta. Can you set them up a show? And I said, well, I'm playing a show that night. They could play with us. And it was at this place called Ivy South on South Fifth. It was like a discotheque, like a weird, like a really weird place. Somehow we set up a show there. And I remember a Black Lips showed up and they came out. And I was like, whoa, these guys, these kids are cool. Like they had red leather jackets and like, they were just chill, cool little punk kids, you know. There was no one in the room except for like maybe four or five people. And I, I remember like they lit the drums on fire. Cole lit his guitar on fire and pulled down his pants and started playing the guitar with his penis. And then he pissed into his mouth and was like spitting it all over the room. I loved it. And then and Jared, all of a sudden, he had blood pouring down his face. And I was like, what is, what the fuck? And then the, and the music was good too. It was just like, dun, 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 dun. and it wasn't necessarily like hardcore chord progressions, riffs, you know, like, da, 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 like fast. It was just like, but like the punk is shit ever. That kind of attitude kind of, kind of stuck with me. I was like, these, they're really smart. These guys are good. That was a, that was pretty cool. And then right around the corner, actually, there was another crazy show. Not that same night. But at Boogaloo Bar, remember Boogaloo Bar? Yes, I spent many weekends of my life in Boogaloo Bar when I first moved here. Well, we, we set up a show. The Coach Whips played that night and we set up an after party show. I don't know if you know, the, the Coach Whips is um, John from the OC's band before the OC's. He was like, hey, can I do my solo project? 
at the after party? I'm like, yeah, sure. And it's called Ziegenbach Cop. And he, and he dressed as a leather daddy and sang techno songs off a CD player. And it was like, I barely knew him then, but I was like, what the fuck? The whole place was packed because he's kind of already legendary under, in the underground, you know? So the place was packed and going crazy. And he was like walking all over the drum kit. And it was, it was our drums, my drummer's drums. And my drummer at that time picked up the CD player and smashed it across the room and ended the show. Wow. And he was like, they, he wanted to fight him because, you know, drums are expensive, you know? Yeah, Boogaloo was a crazy venue. I, we used to do a party there for a while called Trouble and Bass. And it was pretty lawless kind of place. It I don't was. know. There was a lot of drug dealing going on in there. And it was it's a very tiny bar that's now Duff's, which is a really cool um, heavy metal bar oh, yeah. that oh, yeah. has crazy decor that's um, under the or by the JMZ train in Williamsburg. But a lot of the stuff you're talking about is kind of Williamsburg before it became hip yeah. hipster and then before it became like condo land. Yeah. yeah. Um, like, I don't think these v kind of venues could exist in Williamsburg anymore. No. But back then it was like, it was weird to go to Williamsburg. People did everything in the city. There's like a funny energy in there where everyone really wanted to party hard. And then I remember like whenever 3 a.m. around that time rolled around, it got really shady. Scary drug dealers would roll up like 3, 3.30 and just like double park outside. And I don't know, it, 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 it took like a turn for the sinister, I remember. Or like, I remember Cokies? Were you here for Cokies? Cokies was a little bit before my time, but can you tell the non-New Yorkers about Cokies? Cokies was is on the corner where the levee is now. And it was just a, a place. And it was funny because it was in Time Out, New York as one of the tourist places to visit but it was just like you would go up to the door and and it was locked and there's a camera on you and you would knock and th they would let you in if like you, you weren't some shady person and I remember I'd go in there and it was just all the neighborhood people just dancing to like soul music and stuff but no one was drinking because everyone just did blow you know <laughs> didn't they sell coke at Cokie's wasn't that the th yeah you had to go to the DJ and he'll just give you some coke and you had the rule, but you had to do it in the corner. I mean, behind the curtains. Like people knew. Like, what? Okay, New York. <laughs> there was a lot of bars in that era that also people had keys to that were private. And then you'd go there like oh, after oh, yeah. hours. I mean, me there's so many times back then where I'd just be at a bar till noon or something, you know? <laughs> And just board it up and it's closed from the outside, but everyone's just, you know, in, inside. And I remember it was scary walking home from Williamsburg to Greenpoint at that time. Like it was like deserted to walk home. I would walk along Kent Avenue and people would, would do, you know where all those condos are now? People used to have bonfires and stuff along the water. And I don't know, it was, it was fun back then. Yeah, it's a different vibe for sure. So talking about chaotic shows, do you have any other stories about chaotic shows you played at? Oh, another one was like a, <laughs> we played an in-store at Oak. Oak is like a fancy yeah, we, kind of clothing store where everything is black and like, drapey. Like, like fancy goth, kind of. But we played an in-store there and I remember I completely pulled off my pants and I, was, I stood in the window and I was playing and I remember my mom saw a picture of my butt on like Facebook. It's like, why is your pants off? I said, mom, it's just performing. Uh -uh. Like she'll call me sometimes. She's like, why is your face bloody? Like, don't worry, it's fake blood. Even though it's like real. Yeah. There's this party we played. I forgot the gallery. But, um, you know, Mickey Pellerano, he did this ritual and he cut open an eel right before we played. And was eating the eel heart and then we all like grabbed part of it and we started eating the eel heart and we we're playing and that was kind of I don't know, that was kind of a crazy show oh another what, um, crazy show was uh, when I first met King Kong and the barbecue show and we, we we were gonna play with them at Don Pedro's remember Don Pedro's 
Yes, we got a gun pulled on us in the basement of Don Pedro's. <laughs> I remember it well. Don Pedro's uh, like had the coolest punk shows for a while. That was the night we 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 played with King Khan and Barbecue Show, and that's when I first met them. Someone was talking shit in the audience, and he got in a fight. He started hitting someone with his guitar in the middle of the set, and and Mark was throwing a bottle at someone. Like there's, a, it was like a very volatile atmosphere. It was really weird. What I don't know what was in the air that day, but um, they they opened, and then we played, and then. Like there was flower flying around everywhere and I, like it's kind of normal wild show. And we're playing and I turn around and a bass player, this, this bass player was before Alex. It was our first one. Her name was Tralala. And I was like, holy shit, Tralala like, was fighting with someone in the audience. And then I turn around and then a few minutes later, I turn around and someone's trying to strangle her. Like she's getting, I'm like, what? And I couldn't tell if they were friends or not. And we were just all wasted. And you're and still just, playing. Yeah, we're still playing and everyone's just like, oh, oh, there's Chalala getting crazy again. And we're just playing. And then pretty soon, like, she runs off. And then we didn't see her anymore for months. Then uh, a few months later, we were on tour and we were in Memphis and ran into her at the high tone. We were playing at the high tone. And we're like, what the fuck happened to you that night? And she's like, Oh yeah, I got into a f I smashed someone with a bottle outside and almost severed my fingers. And then I had to get rushed to the hospital. Damn. And then she just like disappeared. Um, what venues in New York do you truly miss? There's a place called Happy Birthday Hideout and I had a birthday party and the the Coach Whips played and Guitar Wolf played too. Wow, sick. And it was it was so sick and it was um i remember i fell in into the drums and the, the cymbal split my lip and i was like, covered in blood I, I was like carrie on her birthday or something i don't know i, I thought it was kind of cool ha i think happy birthday hideout turned into like that's where rubelod was for a while and then we played a rubelod party there and all of us took I think some people took mushrooms and some people took something else. What band was that with? This was Golden Triangle. And we were, and I was dressed up as Batman. It wasn't Halloween or, or anything. But I remember I had a Batman get up on. It was a, like a time where people wanted to make records for us. So like there was maybe some kind of important people were going to go there to see us. And we were all so wasted. And all of us, the whole time, were playing different songs. It was... Insane. But everyone was going crazy still. It was just like, whoa, it doesn't even matter. I was just like, what's everyone doing? I'm like playing my own thing. I'm like, and everyone is each in their corner, just like playing their own. It was bananas. The people that were supposed to go, I don't think we got anything from them. Maybe they were looking for a more band that played songs or something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Rubulad is this multi-room warehouse with like cubbies you could crawl in and like go in a room and somebody's DJing but all the records are playing backwards and so that actually that set you played was pretty much perfect yeah, yeah for that's there. perfect <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's so interesting talking when you talk about New York because the venues come and go so quickly probably a bunch I don't we I'm even know sure I don't even know about that bands are you currently playing in right now I, i'm primarily in two maybe i'll maybe count as three maybe there's one called sad white guys i just wanted to make some kind of dance club banger kind of music like kind of like the lcd sound system or something i mean it doesn't sound like that but all of us have like our own separate i'm china white and then there's White Lines, and then there's White Lies, and we're kind of like Wu-Tang Clan. We all have separate solo things, too. 
And then I have another one called Acetone 4 with my, D, my DJ crew, Pet Hospital. That, that one's more like a cough syrup punk or cemetery pop. Someone said, uh, said it sounds like really slowed down New Order, The Cure. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. That's fucking awesome. Two of my favorite bands. So you're no longer in this band called Chorizo, where you guys all sung in Spanish, despite the fact that nobody, I don't think anybody in Chorizo was like a native Spanish speaker, right? Well, it's, it's, no. <laughs> that still, that never ended. We're supposed to have a release with Chorizo coming out and it's getting mixed and mastered right now. Presumably going to play again after that. but. It's hard to jam with people during pandemic, you know? At what point did you realize that you weren't going to be like a regular ass person with a regular ass job? I don't know if there was actually a moment when I thought that. I was just kind of living it the whole time. I think I just realized I just like doing something that makes me travel because <laughs> I love to travel. It's like pretty much like being in a, a, a band is just like a, a free travel ticket to go places. I don't think anyone makes money unless you're really big touring. But if you break even, it's like, I don't know, you get a vacation and you meet a lot of friends. You meet all these, like a payoff of meeting people you wouldn't have met, you know? Oh, well, of course, my parents thought I was going to be a doctor or something. But I think they realized after I moved to New York, they realized like. That's it. No, yeah, yeah. We lost him. <laughs> yeah. And not, you know, you're not going to be a doctor. She sees these naked pictures of me in blood. She's like, okay. I mean, how has it been for you just like not having that release that you were talking about of going to play live shows? I'm going crazy. Yeah, I, I think know. a I'm lot of people are. I'm losing my mind. I, I didn't realize I'd miss it as much, you know, but I don't know. I, I miss performing in front of people. It's not something to be taken for granted. I, I mean, I, I, I was like, oh, this is cool. I could, whatever, no shows for a while. But I actually do miss it. I miss hitting the road. I miss, I don't know. I just feel like I'm on a, in a space pod on Mars, like Matt Damon, the Martian, you know, just in my, <laughs> in my apartment, just like nowhere, nowhere to go. What are some just don'ts? Like, what are some things... If you're playing with another band and they do these things, like, you know, every scene has their unspoken don'ts. I would say just play wherever you're assigned to in the lineup. I've been to so many shows where people, I don't want to open. I don't want to do this. I want to, I don't want to close. I don't want to open. Like it, it, it like gets all confusing. Not in official venues because it's all official, but like little shows that mo most bands play. I mean, I like to open, you know? So if people say, don't want me to open, I, I just want to open so that no one wants to play after me, you know, just fucking kill the room. And don't worry about perfection with the songs. Some bands like perform, like practice for a whole year before to play a show to be perfect the song. But it's just like, I don't know. I don't think I've ever played any song in my whole life the same twice, you know? I feel like songs are just a process it's just like a snapshot of a moment in time. Like, like if you record an album on a certain date, that's the way it's going to sound, you know, like instead of like, oh, let's re-record it. We play it better now, like a month later, like, oh, why we changed it. Like, no, it's just like, that's how it sounds on, from December 12th. That's what we sound like. Just fucking press it, you know, move on, make new songs. And when you play it live, it might not even sound like, you're not going to sound like the record. So just perform, just be, be cool, perform and have some attitude. I know that you stopped drinking and doing drugs a couple years back. Was it difficult to play shows and get wild and do all the things that you did before once you were sober? Oh, fuck. Yeah, that was hard. Actually, I was inspired by my friend, my friend Ruby. She's a, cause she's sober and she like would fucking kill it. And I'm like, like, how do you do this? You just gotta figure it out, you know? And once you figure it out, you're never going back. And then I realized I just started performing better. And also you remember, <laughs> you remember things. 
<laughs> I I don't know. It like the first few times I was so nervous. I'm like, God, I'm gonna crack. I'm I gotta do some sh- fucking shots of Jameson because usually I would do two or three shots before I play because I'm so nervous. But then after a couple of shows, like I kind of embrace the intense nervousness and like you kind of just have to deal with it. I think it's physiologically and mentally so much more satisfying. And I'm just like, whoa, it's just like good sex. I don't know any other way to articulate it. Like I look at people, I'm just more aware of the room, the environment. And it took a while. It took a few times though before I got accustomed to it. And after that, it just seems very much more rewarding. It's evolution, you know? This, I'm just an evolving human. <laughs> True that. Um, do you have any other tips for like how to keep doing this for so long? Because you've really played thousands of shows and been doing this for years and like somehow managed to stay afloat and stay on top of it and keep creating. And that's honestly like hats off to you because a lot of people burn out on this lifestyle. Well, just in life in, in general, it's just like, what's something you would want to do if, you, if like for free? Like, oh, if you had like a month off and then you just do it, you know? Not to say I, I get paid a lot. Like every now and then I'll get like some sink or something and get a bunch of money or little royalties here and there, like a fun tour. But like, it's something I would do for free. What, the thing that you would want to do for free is, is, the, is your gift to the world, you know, why you were born. I love that. Well, it's always inspiring to me to see you having fun and like putting fun out into the world because I think a lot of people are not having fun and not doing what they want to be doing. So thank you for existing, OJ. You're welcome. <laughs> I just, I just want to bring joy to people, you know. You're like the Filipino Santa. <laughs> OJ, thank you so much for joining me here on Rave to the Grave. You're welcome. It was so fun. Peace. Rave to the Grave is recorded at the Newsstand Studios at Rockefeller Center. This podcast is produced and hosted by me, Vivian Host. Our theme song is by Star Eyes. The rest of the music you hear in this episode is from bands that OJ has been a part of including Sad White Guys, Acetone 4, X-Ray Eyeballs, and Chorizo. Check them out on Bandcamp or visit our website at ravetothegrave.org for more extras and links from every episode. You can also find us on Instagram at ravetothe.grave. And make sure to check out our episodes on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like Rave to the Grave, please leave us a comment or a rating. It helps a lot. Until next time permission to party.